I'm uh, going to be doing a, um, a reptile prep today. And this is of an animal, um, a Dipsosaurus dorsalis, that's the genus of species. It's a, a desert iguana that was um, actually found in a mist net at Boyd Deep Canyon uh, Research Center, which is one of our UC reserves. Actually, this is from 2008, so it's a 12-year-old specimen that was in the freezer. <laughs> but it's still very nice looking, as you can see, even though it's been in the freezer a long time. Um, the DNA quality probably won't be as good for this because it's been in the freezer so long and I've had it thawing today, but um, and it might have been dead at the time that it was actually found too. So Okay, so I'm wearing one glove because I'm going to do some writing and then when I'm taking the tissue. So first thing you have to do is take measurements, which is what we do with everything, um, because once the animal gets prepped, sort of interestingly, they actually shrink when they're in ethanol for long periods of time. So the measurements now with a live, with a freshly dead animal or Recently, you know, dead a while ago, but you know, a freshly dissolved animal, is, the measurements in real life are gonna be different than they are later when the animal um, is in ethanol for a while. So, um, okay, so I already did a weight on it. So I, I do the weight in um, grams, so it's 39 grams. And then I just have a little ruler. And so with all amphibians and reptiles, we do what's called a snout vet length. And so that's the, the um, length from the length of the, the tip of the snout and to the vent, right? So they have one opening, that's where um, they defecate through, they urinate, um, and they and eggs come out of there, or live birth, if they're animals that get live birth, I think. Okay, so we go. So, and I measure things in millimeters, so um, it's exactly 11 centimeters, so 110 millimeters for this not vent. So that's 27, okay. So that's the tail length. And um, a lot of lizards actually will lose a tail. Um, like geckos are especially well known for this and some even like scloperous, the fence lizards. But um, this guy has a really beautiful long tail that looks like it's never been um, regrown. And I have two solutions over here that I have my, I actually have hydrogen peroxide and so that's what we clean all our instruments with to make sure that we're rinsing off any blood or DNA from anything previous. So each one is gonna be a unique sample and we don't wanna mix it up. I also don't wanna get my DNA in here, so I'm gonna put on gloves. Um, although I've already been touching it, but you know. <laughs> we're gonna actually in, um, cut into the inside. And so typically with herps, um, it matters what kinds of genomic study or DNA you're gonna be using, but typically, or like if you're using RNA or something, this has been dead for a long time, so probably just somebody's gonna want um, a liver sample that they can then use in, in a, you know, maybe they're doing a study, a study of these populations, or they're doing a study on like a bunch of different species of iguanians um, in the deserts and they just need a sample. And so what I'll do is I'll actually take out the whole liver of the animal. Um, and that's typically for me the only tissue I take. If, uh, and so the second solution, sorry, is water and I'm just rinsing it off. So you just wanna make sure it's really dry. Okay, so I'm gonna go in sort of right below, in the middle of the body cavity. And then, and the idea is you're trying to make the smallest cut possible. Uh, I already have a tissue sample, uh, tissue tube, sorry, ready with my um, collector number on it. So it won't get a catalog number till later. So all animals are actually gonna have two numbers. They're gonna have the catalog number when we actually accession it and catalog it into the collection, but they'll have a field number. The field number is really important because it, it has my initial CLS and then a number, and that is a unique number that no other animal I've ever collected had. So it's 971, and almost at a thousand. And, um, and so then somebody can go to my field notes and find that unique number and uh, and look at the data for this animal. So, okay. okay, so that is, uh, so it ate something recently, so that's sort of a fun thing. So this big sort of sack looking thing is actually its stomach. And it, these guys eat lots of insects, so that's typically what you're gonna find. So I wanna keep the animals intact as possible because it's gonna go, there's a liver. Okay, so that big thing I pulled out was the stomach and then this thing right here. And it looks like a liver. It has that sort of dark red with um, multiple lobes. Um, and so, and we're gonna stick this in a freezer. So I'm gonna cut off as much of the liver as I can. So for 
I guess if there's ever somebody who wants to study lizards and reptiles, they're probably not in good shape because a lot of our specimens collected after 1970 do not have livers anymore. Okay, so that's a whole big piece of liver. And um, if I was gonna be putting this in some kind of solution, like RNA later, if it was collected fresh, then I would cut the liver into pieces to make sure that all of it was really sufficed, you know, suffused, sorry, with the, the um, RNA later or with ethanol or whatever I was putting it in, but um, you know, whatever kind of preservative. But with this guy, we're just gonna freeze it right now. So it did get thawed and then frozen again, but okay. And then, um, yeah. You don't really, one thing you don't really ever want to take as a tissue sample is stomach because stomach is going to be full of other animals, in this case, insects, and um, you'd be getting the genome of those things instead of your animal of interest. So, okay, that's sort of a big cut, but I'll try to just put everything back together a little bit. Okay, so here's my tissue. It's already labeled. And, um, okay, and then I can put, so you can see when you put it into the hydrogen peroxide, all the blood. It falls apart, and then I'll wipe off the blood. That liver looked great. It really looked nice and intact. So I think that animal was very freshly dead at the time it was frozen. Okay, and so with herps, um, another thing that's different from birds and mammals is um, if you are collecting a lot, you'll actually get your own tags printed. So you can see my initials are CLS. So and um, and I have a whole. Now there are a thousand of these somewhere. And um, I had them printed and then I go, and one of the things students help us with is they tie string onto tags. <laughs> so our, my field tags have our printed tag like this and it's ethanol proof, so it's not gonna come off in the formula or ethanol. And then we also have the printed catalog tags. So, okay, so I'm gonna cut off my next number, which I already wrote. Okay, so I just tied the tag on to the leg, and then, um, so that way this animal will never get lost from its data. That's probably the most important thing you can do, is one, take as much data as you possibly can, and two, don't ever misplace the ID of the animal, the number from the animal, because otherwise you can never figure out what it, it was. Um, and then there's a whole animal that's gonna be stored in ethanol, but we're gonna prep it in formalin. And then um, I did take one tissue, so it's liver, and it's frozen, so I'm gonna put that down so I remember later. Um, we also put barcodes on the tissues. I don't usually do that till I'm ready to catalog them, but you could actually put the barcode on right now, and that's how you track the tissues for our system. And then um, the barcode uh, can get, be written in here too. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and then if there's any other notes on how it was collected, so this was found dead in a mist net which I'm gonna put that in the locality information, but I'm also, um, that's a, a sort of like a collecting event about how it was collected. So I'm gonna inject it with the formalin, so um, it's pretty breezy in here. So normally I would do this under the fume hood, but you're standing far enough away, I think we're fine. <laughs> and um, so this is formalin from upstairs. So formalin is 10% formalin, so it's formaldehyde that's mixed like 3% formaldehyde that's mixed uh, 9 to 1. Okay, And then the first thing I'm actually going to do is um, I want the formalin to be able to get everywhere, but you can't really inject into the tail very easily. So I'm going to make a bunch of little holes in the tail and the arms um, so that the formalin can get in. So, so basically I try, and this is, I um, already prepared this with paper towel. This is just water. I, start, I try to like minimize how much formalin we have around us because it is a carcinogen. And, um, and so that's why I wear gloves and this is just water and I've just gotten this wet so that I can, uh, can place it. And then when I'm done, I'll put the formula on it. So, so I'm just injecting just to make little holes in the arms with the needle. So I'm not actually injecting anything. I'm just, okay. And then I'll leave the mouth and then the same thing here. Okay. And then an interesting factoid, um, so uh, squamates or lizards and snakes all have um, two penises. They're called hemipenes, and they inject one or the other into the females when they're mating. Um, and so I'm gonna see, I think this is a female, but if it was a male, I could actually avert the hemipenes, which is um, I sort of put the formalin in and yeah, nothing's happening. So I think I'm pretty sure there's a female because I don't see the large scales either. So. 
Okay, so I'm not gonna keep doing that because I don't want her vent to be all exploded. So, okay, so now I'm gonna just do a little more injecting. Again, um, the idea behind this is you're basically preserving the tissues in this form and sort of in that sort of set way that we have them prepared to get in jars and also for doing measurements. And I don't want the tissue to rot, right? I want it to be completely effused with the, this liquid, the formalin. And then after it sits in the formalin for a couple days, I'll rinse it out and put it in ethanol. So, and that basically, those two things prevent them from ever rotting if you've done it correctly. Okay, and then I put a little bit of formalin in the middle of the body. Okay, and then I made such a big hole that it's coming out, so I think that's fine. And then I'll make some species, um, the teeth, like especially turtles or some salamanders. Oh, I can't even get in there. The, the teeth, um, so lizards and amphibians have teeth and honestly snakes. And so those are really important. So sometimes we actually will preserve things with the mouth more open. We'll like sort of open up the mouth and put a little piece of paper towel in there when we're preserving it. Okay, so this guy, actually considering it's been in the freezer for 12 years, it actually looks great. So, okay. So then what I'm doing is I'm spreading the arms out. So like that, sort of stick them up. Um, pose, and I'm trying to make sure, and then I, I take all the fingers and I try to, um, and toes and just try to get them apart from each other a little bit in case somebody wants to look at those specifically. Okay, and then, and again, I was saying that I want to preserve it. So if I preserve the tail out long, it's just too gigantic for any of our jars. So anything with a big long tail like this, I'm going to preserve it with the tail sort of curved like that. So, so somebody can still measure the tail, but it was curved. Okay. And it isn't, I know, that's as much as I can really do in getting the form on it um, the way I want it because it just doesn't want to move. So, okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, and then I'm gonna put a little bit of formalin all over the top of it. So, so this is how we prepare animals with herps. A lot of times, actually, the animals are, um, they come to us already prepared. Somebody will do all this whole process in the field, like outside. So, I'll put this on. And you want to put enough formalin that it's soaking really well, but you don't want it floating because you want to maintain that shape. So, I'm just going to put a little bit more formalin on the top. And then, yeah, that seems good. Okay, and then it'll. Fuse over the whole thing. So. Okay, and it looks excellent for something that's been frozen for that long. So after the specimen gets cataloged, it gets another tag tied on here, it gets put in the collection with the other animals from that same county, um, and then we take the tissue samples that you saw that I took that I froze, and then we put it in, on a barcode, we actually scan it into our database, and then we track it with these barcodes into barcoded boxes, into these giant doers, and each doer holds about like 90,000 tissues. So once that whole process is done, we have students that actually help with all that. I usually have students that even help me with the prepping, they'll help tie tags on all these animals, they'll help put all the data into spreadsheets and help me upload them, they'll do all the barcoding and putting them away. Then um, we, we actually, then the specimens actually immediately go online when they're cataloged and are available for people to do research with them. And so we might have somebody that wants to come in and look at diet of the species over the long term. Maybe bees were collected in the 50s or even earlier, and so they want to look at an animal that was collected more recently, see if there's changes in their diet. Somebody can also do some genomics or um, other research using them that using the DNA that we collected from those tissues and um, and a number of other reasons. So the idea is really that even though this animal sort of died accidentally, we're not just going to discard it. It's actually super useful for somebody else over the long term. And because they're in ethanol, they'll actually last for hundreds of years. So that's sort of the purpose of why we collect all these animals.